B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Super Duper Super Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020. This is a pivotal day. Will Democratic voters embrace radical change? Or will they be seduced by the false promise of a return to normal under old dog Joe Biden? Now, you've seen it right before your eyes since Saturday. The media hype of the importance of Biden's significant win, significant in terms of the uh, margin of his victory, but not significant in turning the tide of this presidential primary race. But that's how it's been spun up and all over the corporate media. I watched PBS. I watched MSNBC. I watched some CNN. And what we see is the gatekeepers are putting their thumbs on the scale and instructing Americans that the right thing to do is to rally around a candidate who is so obviously flawed. And as the Democratic establishment decides that Biden is the horse they want to ride, they fail to consider that he may ride right over a cliff. And will they ride with him? If so, how far? And this is a deja vu moment. It's 2016 redux. Because at this stage of the campaign, four years ago, we knew the serious flaws of Hillary Clinton, her self-inflicted wounds over the corporate speeches, over the secret email server in the bathroom of the mansion in Chappaqua, the incredible effort she went to to keep those emails secret, the interference of the FBI, yes, it was a real factor. But at this stage, the superdelegates who controlled the convention chose not to allow democracy to operate. But instead, in their sense of arrogance, entitlement, and the role of establishment players, they tilted for Hillary against Bernie. It created some of the divides that remain in the Democratic Party today. And so, as we see the intervention of the adults to try to keep the children who would bring us Bernie Sanders from ruining their party, and that's a lowercase party, (laughs) you know, like a festive one. It's a party of corporate control. It is a party that is uh, apparently satisfied to be the number two corporate party behind the Republicans who are now shifting more toward the oligarch party. And with the entry of Mike Bloomberg and his unlimited fortune, the Democrats have had a dalliance with an oligarch who claims to support democratic values. And so today the voters are going to decide. It's the first chance for people to vote for or against Mike Bloomberg. And some people who didn't mail in a ballot. And I walked Chloe to the polls this morning at my local church. It's a ritual we've been engaged in for her entire life. She's 10. (laughs) And so I was able to make my vote uh, with all of the information available. But there are many Californians who mailed in their ballots last week, some of them screaming in agony because they voted for Amy or for Pete, who have since pulled out, or Tom Steyer, who's withdrawn as well. And so how does Bloomberg shape up after investing half a billion dollars in saturation advertising? He sent me the largest political mailer I've ever received. (laughs) It didn't change my mind in any way. And so the party leaders who made this move extremely late, as I say, Biden's bump in California, which would draw not not all, but some of the people who had intended to or did vote for Klobuchar or Buttigieg or Steyer, 
or even, you know, down the road a few miles back, Kamala Harris. Many of those people might have an intention to vote for Biden, but we don't know uh, what, what the breakdown will be as to how many people voted before this intervention by the top party leaders. So Elizabeth Warren says she's staying in. She's cashed up for the moment. She's likely to lose her home state of Massachusetts to Bernie Sanders tonight. And there are people who speculate that she's part of a scheme with the Biden team, that if she stays in the race to draw votes away from Bernie, that she'll be rewarded with the vice presidency. And I think there's similar speculation among Klobuchar fans that her exit from the race and her gushing endorsement in Dallas of Biden last night will earn her the VP slot. And so as the party leaders have bet large on a lame, tired horse again, it comes down to the strength of Bernie Sanders. And based on the polling that was released on Friday here in California, I feel pretty confident that he will prevail tonight. The shift may be that as of Friday, Biden didn't appear to have a chance to hit the 15% threshold and pick up delegates here in California. With the exit of Buttigieg and Klobuchar and the elasticity that is now in the electorate, Biden might squeak by at more than 15%. Last week, one poll showed Elizabeth Warren at 14%, not clearing the margin. Another showed her at 17%. And I do think that there are voters who are energized to support her. And I expect that in California, she will pick up delegates and clear that 15% margin. But if you don't live in California, I want to warn you, we will not know the full results tonight. We'll have an idea of the big picture. But because so many people vote by mail, and California law allows you to mail that mail-in ballot on Election Day, as long as it's postmarked today, some of those won't even be received at the registrar's offices until Thursday or Friday. So, generously, <laughs> you can expect a provisional result in California in a week or 10 days. Then already we're getting reports of anomalies, problems in the voting. Our friend Ian Berman checked in. He said, my brother Joel has lived in an apartment in San Francisco for 28 and a half years. He went to vote today as always. And they told him that he'd been signed up for an absentee ballot to vote by mail. He said he never authorized that. And they told him that they had sent him a postcard in the mail. So they gave him a provisional ballot. And Ian asked, wasn't there a problem with counting them before? Well, Greg Pallast has argued repeatedly that provisional ballots are often never counted. And this is just the first anecdote of problem voting in California. The election protection people are really focused on Los Angeles County, which is using new uh, ballot marking devices. And there are grave concerns about the reliability and the hackability of these systems. So I think it is going to be a long night. But I also believe that this is a pivotal moment for the reasons I just outlined. And I'd like you to hear a man who I consider to be so out of touch, who does not understand the Sanders phenomenon, his appeal to young voters. And this is the man that the Democratic leadership has closed ranks around in the last 48 hours. And look, the idea that uh, um, there's going to be this revolution Americans aren't looking for revolution. They're looking for progress. Yeah. But, Mr. Vice President, some, some seem keen on a revolution. Well, some do, but look at the numbers. He's not going to come anywhere near generating the kind of participation of young folks that Barack did in 2008. There's no evidence of that yet. Bernie Sanders won Nevada, won New Hampshire, came in a close second in Iowa. He's expected 
to finish second or third here in South Carolina? If he does, how can you then continue to make the claim that he's not electable? Because I talked to all the people who are in those states that we have to win. Find me someone running for the Senate in North Carolina who wants him to campaign for him. Find somebody in Texas who wants him to campaign for him. I know Joe. This is Clyburn. We know Joe. But most importantly, Joe knows us. Well, <laughs> that closes my case. James Clyburn just sealed my, my point here. Joe Biden doesn't know us. Joe Biden is so out of touch, he does not know the electorate that he is begging to haul him over the finish line. And it stuns me that the leadership of the party that has access to all the same polling that I do is going to take this risky bet to try to snuff out Sanders and the would-be revolution and try to jam in Joe Biden in an effort to fend off Mike Bloomberg. Now, I think the Bloomberg play here is fascinating. The Democratic National Committee welcomed his entry into the race. They changed the debate rules to accommodate him. Then he fucked up in the debate, did a little better the second time. Despite the half billion that he's dropped so far, it appears that uh, whoever in the Democratic leadership was leaning toward Bloomberg has fallen out of love with the guy. And Jeremy Scahill, not a perfect guy. I've followed his work for many years. He's over at The Intercept now with Glenn Greenwald and the team. But I value his voice as a progressive. And I want you to hear the first part of this video report that he published at The Intercept today, Bernie Sanders and the Establishment Red Scare. Scahill here, I think, really demonstrates that he knows what he's talking about. We are witnessing the beginning stages of the cataclysmic meltdown that will occur among the elite political and economic class in the United States if Bernie Sanders wins a majority of the delegates in the Democratic primary. This thing is going very well for Vladimir Putin. And then you have this shameless class of neocons, lifelong right-wing Republicans, so-called conservative pundits who refer to themselves as never-Trumpers, they have been in this wild, weird alliance with the MSNBC DNC crowd in the Trump era. And now they are offering their totally unsolicited and unwanted panic addled advice for what Democrats should do and how urgent it is to stop Bernie Sanders. Calling Democratic members of Congress, governors and other leaders. Could you perhaps say in public? What you say in private, that a Sanders nomination would be a disaster for the party. Trump could very easily win re-election, especially if Bernie Sanders Max is the Democratic Boots nominee. Speaking. Trump critic David Frum puts it more directly. Bernie can't win. I'm sorry, but Bill Kristol, Max Boot, David Frum, and all these other neocons have no standing whatsoever to pretend to tell the working people in this country people who fight for economic, racial, gender justice, against wars of aggression, who to support for the Democratic nomination. Well, I give Scahill credit there. I think in a minute and a half, he sums it up quite well. And just a little lighter moment here. David Feldman is a longtime stand-up comic, and he's a friend of mine on Facebook. He posted late yesterday, Klobuchar and Mayor Pete build themselves as practical centrists who could get things done. And they're right. They got things done. Both of their campaigns are done. They're finished because they're practical. And centrists are all about compromising until you've lost. <laughs> Jeff Weaver, a longtime advisor to Sanders, was on the Today Show today. Oh, I'm sorry. He was responding to Amy Klobuchar's appearance on the Today Show today, where she said that she's not an establishment Democrat. Neither is Beto O'Rourke or Pete Buttigieg. And Jeff Weaver fired back, Look, being young doesn't make you not part of the establishment. It's all about the ideas that you hold. You know, Pete and Amy and Beto, frankly, all three of them, no dis disrespect to them, but they are all, they all articulated the same old, same old that Joe Biden is articulating. 
Except for their age, in many ways they were indistinguishable from Joe, which is why a number of them had trouble getting traction in this race. So it's not a surprise that they would support him, and in fact they do support the same old ideas that led to the election of Trump. Weaver teamed up with Faz Shakir, the campaign manager, and they issued a memo today. The establishment bets on Joe Biden, it won't work. And they echo some of the comments that I made and add, Heading into Super Tuesday, the choice in the Democratic primary is crystal clear. Voters face a decision between Bernie's working class movement and his message of change and Biden's effort to, in his own words, make sure that nothing will fundamentally change for the billionaire class that buys elections. They continued, with Biden bankrolled by a super PAC boosted by billionaire donors, the primary is far from over. We are entering the phase in which the differences between Bernie and Biden will take center stage. And then they don't get personal. I'll do that in a minute. They stick to the issues. They say that Trump is pushing Social Security cuts and Joe Biden spent 30 years trying to cut Social Security. That is a fact. They talk about the bad trade deals that Biden has supported. Trump's new NAFTA, the old NAFTA, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Then on health care, you know the difference. Bernie rejects super PAC money, fights for Medicare for all. Biden is being bankrolled by a super PAC run by health care industry lobbyists and opposing Medicare for all. Then there's the bankruptcy bill that Joe Biden championed for his benefactors in Delaware. And, of course, his foreign policy blunders on the war in Iraq and other matters that occurred during the Obama administration. Oh, like, you know, Libya, Syria. Yemen. Elizabeth Warren paused to congratulate Joe Biden for the South Carolina victory and then returned to the attack. She said no matter how many Washington insiders tell you to support him, nominating their fellow Washington insider will not meet this moment. Nominating a man who says we don't need any fundamental change in this country will not meet this moment. Nominating someone who wants to restore the world before Donald Trump when the status quo has been leaving more and more people behind for decades is a big risk for our party and our country. Now, for the record, I support Elizabeth Warren and her decision to stay in this race as long as she wants. I don't sit around and tell candidates who are not my first choice when and how they should end a campaign. Now, in her commentary, she didn't go after Sanders directly, but she repeated her comment, uh, this crisis demands more than a senator who has good ideas but whose 30-year track record shows he consistently calls for things that he fails to get done and consistently opposes things he nevertheless fails to stop. Okay. I don't consider that to be a low blow, and I'm not sure that it will have much impact. Now we take you down under for the commentary of the sharp-tongued Caitlin Johnstone. She writes that back in January, one of her uh, uh, sources, a journalist named Ruth Ann Oskoloff, Oskolkoff, sorry, got a message from her reliable source. This person had interactions earlier that evening with high-level party members, associates of the Democratic National Committee, who said they have now selected Biden as the nominee with Warren as the VP. They also said the plan is to smear Bernie as a Russian asset. She also cites our mutual friend Max Blumenthal, that back way back in July of 2017 at the height of the Russiagate uh, narrative, Blumenthal told uh, good old Tucker Carlson, this Russia hysteria will be repurposed by the political establishment to attack the left and anyone on the left, a Bernie Sanders-like politician who steps out of line on the issues of permanent war or corporate free trade, things like that, will be painted as Russia puppets. Well, we've already heard those vague rumblings. Yeah, that Russia is meddling again in 2020 and wants to help Bernie. Zero evidence of that, and we have a report on it coming up. So, Caitlin Johnstone returns to Biden's recent gaffes. Just the other day, he told people to vote on Super Thursday. 
And then, this is a direct quote. He was saying, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women created by the, you know, you know the thing. <laughs> and so she describes him as there's simply no comparing the befuddled, fuzz-brained man we see before us today with the sharp, lucid speaker we were seeing even a few years ago. The man's brain doesn't work. At the debate last week, he declared that 150 million people have been killed by gun violence. And no one has really brought that up since, at least not in the coverage that I see. So we were just down under in Australia with John Stone. Now we hopscotch over to New Zealand to get the report about the quiet hand behind the scenes, the hand, the hidden hand of Barack Obama. So I'm citing a quote here from the uh, New, Ze New Zealand Herald. And the reason is I did a search online for the phrase Obama hidden hand. And so far, this has not been used in recent coverage in the Washington Post or the New York Times. I did a search on each website just before the show today. There is a reference from New York Times columnist Peter Baker talking about Obama's hidden hand in July of 2013. So it's NBC that first reported this, and the New Zealand Herald picked it up. But not the Wash Post, not the New York Times. And according to NBC, Barack Obama's hidden hand has played a subtle role in the sudden surge of support for Biden, who served him loyally as vice president for eight years. Quote, there appears to be a quiet hand behind the rapid movement, former President Barack Obama. So, Mr. Obama, let me direct this to you. Why are you interfering in a democratic process to promote a man that you're not even willing to publicly endorse, to foist him on the rest of us? And what if this bet fails badly and colossally and quickly? It could happen tonight. Now, I expect Joe Biden to win Alabama. But he's going to lose big, I believe, in California and Texas, the two delicate rich states. And if Sanders rolls up victories in Klobuchar's Minnesota, in Warren's Massachusetts, he could be unstoppable. And then I guess your number two is Mike Bloomberg, huh? <laughs> so... Paul Waldman, who I've mentioned before, when he was with Media Matters uh, 12 years ago, he used to appear weekly on my syndicated radio show. And we'd talk about uh, the evils of Fox News and how they were spinning the Bush administration at that time. And Waldman is even handed today in the Washington Post, Sanders is a terribly risky nominee, but so is Biden. Well, he starts with Joe. He says that... Uh, his victory in South Carolina doesn't change the fundamental fact that he is simply terrible at running for president, even worse than in his disastrous runs in 1988 and 2008. Those who are on the campaign trail will tell you that he's showing his age. He starts sentences, then can't find his way out of them. He's surly when challenged. He says cringeworthy things on a daily basis. His debate performances have ranged from barely acceptable to abysmal. Well, Paul, I appreciate your honesty there. That's how I feel. Waldman continues, it's possible that Biden can win over voters in the middle who are tired of Trump, that Biden offers the reassurance of an old white guy who talks a lot about how we can all get along if we just wind the clock back four years and pretend Trump never happened. But it's also possible, if not likely, that Biden will prove to be an uninspiring candidate of the kind Democrats have ridden to defeat so many times before. One who will lose more votes through the deadening of turnout than he'll win by converting Republicans. Then he turns to Bernie Sanders and has predictable comments that uh, he's sympathetic to most but not all of Bernie's proposals, but there's no denying that he proposes radical change. And that's the primary reason he thinks that Bernie is a risky candidate. Sam Husseini, who is an activist in Washington, a progressive guy who works with Norman Solomon, 
what is it called? The um, hmm, Committee for Public Accuracy? Something like that. Anyway, he says, look, if the Democrats rob Sanders of the nomination, we could just burn the party down, or we could cave in and go along with Biden. But he has a third proposal, and that is what he calls the vote pact strategy. In November, disenchanted Democrats team up with disenchanted Republicans. They pair up. And instead of voting for candidates they don't want, they pair up and vote for a third party or independent candidate of their choice. And he primarily offers this as a threat to the Democratic leadership, hoping that it would not need to be used. Interesting idea. And meanwhile... I just want to point out the vulnerabilities of Joe Biden. We are going to be hearing about Ukraine again. Senator Ron Johnson, the Republican from Wisconsin, has been working to subpoena a witness tied to Burisma. They want to keep the whole Ukraine thing alive. And all I can tell you is that when you hear Democrats say that Joe and Hunter Biden never, ever did anything wrong, It's as credible as Trump saying that his phone call with Zelensky was perfect. And Ron Johnson's effort brings up a big question. The appeals court said the Democrats can't enforce subpoenas against Republicans if Trump orders them not to respond to them. So will Hunter Biden, if he is subpoenaed, be able to say, look, You didn't make uh, John Bolton come in. You didn't make Don McGahn, the former White House counsel, testify. And so things could run off the rails in that manner. Nevertheless, the scandal will remain alive. And today, the New York Post, that's a Murdoch product. They brought in Peter Schweitzer, the guy who had dug deep into the Clinton's finances back in 2016. And he reports on... Five members of Joe Biden's family who've gotten rich through his connections. Now, I won't quote everything here, but I have linked to the article and you can read it. The link is in the show file for this podcast at PeterBCollins.com. Joe Biden's younger brother, James, cashed in through a company called Hillstone International. They got a sweetheart deal on a reconstruction contract in Iraq part of a $35 billion package. And the report here is that uh, James Biden participated in profits of $735 million. Then there's Hunter. We know all about Ukraine and Burisma, but how, how about Burnham Ventures? Burnham became the center of a federal investigation involving a $60 million fraud scheme against the Oglala Sioux Tribe. And the principal of the scheme, Devin Archer, was arrested way back in 2016, charged with orchestrating a scheme to defraud investors and a Native American tribal entity. Hunter Biden escaped scrutiny in that case. And then we have brother Frank Biden, that's Joe's brother, who took a ride on Air Force Two to Costa Rica and came back with some more sweetheart deals. He got approval to build in the jungles of Costa Rica thousands of homes, a world-class golf course, casinos, an anti-aging center. And guess what? The year before, the Obama administration had authorized a $6.5 million taxpayer-backed loan for a project approved by the Costa Rican Ministry of Public Education. And then there's Valerie Owens. She is the sister of Joe Biden. She's also the senior partner in a political ad firm, Joe Slade White. Now, I happen to respect the work of Joe Slade White because I've run campaigns where he was doing the media for an opponent. And he is really good. But Joe Slade White and company, the only other principal was Valerie Biden Owens. And in just one case in 2008, they scored two and a half million dollars in consulting fees. But the real profit in a political campaign is in placing the televised media. You get a 15% commission, (laughs) and that's how people really score in uh, campaign uh, employment. 
Every day I pause for a second to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. Great people like Joe Clarici, who's been chipping in for years now. Raul Castillo, who just doubled his monthly contribution. Thank you, Raul. Perry DiLorenzo is a fairly new subscriber, just uh, started here a couple of days ago. Perry, thank you for your support. And if you haven't heard your name mentioned, you can fix that. All you got to do is visit PeterBCollins.com. You click on the menu tab, click on Become a Subscriber. When you hit the sign-up page, boom, you can choose the level of support that is comfortable for you. I mentioned Hillary's email issues from 2016. Mike Bloomberg, when he was mayor of New York, used a private server at the Bloomberg Media Empire for his emails and for staff emails. And seven years after he left office... He is still not willing to release them. Now, it apparently wasn't illegal for him to have a private server at the time, but, you know, (laughs) it's deja vu. Bloomberg told a reporter in Miami that he's not dropping out of the race. He's in it to win it. And he acknowledged that the only way he can win is through a contested convention. I pity a fool named James Homan. He writes for the Washington Post. They dispatched him to Oklahoma City to interview Pete Buttigieg. But he landed there on the day that Pete pulled out of the race. So then she, he, stick, st- he, sticked around. he stuck around and drove to Tulsa because Amy Klobuchar was about to appear. But then she withdrew from the race, and he was there with nothing to do. <laughs> so he dropped in on the Mike Bloomberg office in uh, Tulsa. And he found a busy operation with staffers, but only one volunteer. There was something like six people watching. Oh, there were four paid staffers watching a volunteer (laughs) make phone calls. (laughs) And by the way, Bernie Sanders won Oklahoma, beating Hillary Clinton in 2016, 52 to 42. So we'll see how that bears up tonight. The voting will be disrupted in Tennessee, particularly around Nashville, where tornadoes ripped into communities, killing at least 22 people last night, demolishing homes and businesses. I'd suggest they uh, reset for at least a week away. Our government is reassuring us as they promote more fear. They have not identified any foreign hacking operations directly targeting election infrastructure here on Super Tuesday. Wow. It's a good thing I voted at the Presbyterian Church and not the Russian Orthodox Church around the corner. (laughs) Let's keep those fear levels up, everybody. That's how it works. Mitch McConnell is meddling in the Senate primary in North Carolina. A super PAC with ties to him is spending $3 million to boost the more progressive candidate. Trying to defeat former state Senator Cal Cunningham, who is the moderate ben, uh, moderate uh, pick, and supporting a more liberal candidate, state Senator Erica Smith. I'll take it. <laughs> That's money Mitch can't spend on Republicans. There is a bipartisan effort in the House that is surfacing to at least modify, if not prevent, the renewal of one of the domestic surveillance laws that is expiring on March 15th. There are three provisions. One allows the FBI to obtain court orders to collect business records on subjects in national security investigations. Those are the dreaded national security letters that I've railed against for years. There's the roving wiretap provision. And... The authority to monitor subjects who don't have ties to international terrorism organizations. That's the loophole that's used to frame up Muslim Americans. Although it appears that 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 trend has been slowing in the last year or so. When I wrote my copy, the death toll from coronavirus in the United States stood at six. When I checked again just before I started recording the podcast... The number has risen to nine. Most of the deaths at the uh, uh, nursing facility in Kirkland, Washington. And the Federal Reserve intervened, lowered interest rates by half a point. I I, I mean, (laughs) and, and the markets did rally yesterday, but they slid again today. 
And this has been one of my complaints. Trump has has just, you know, hammered the Federal Reserve to keep interest rates low so that he can run the economic engine flat out. And it gives us no elasticity to deal with an emergency like the economic slowdown that I believe will lead to a worldwide recession caused by this pandemic. And I want to give you a quick snapshot. On Saturday, I was over at the harbor, and I looked up and there was this huge container ship sailing by, headed for the port of Oakland. And I took another look and I saw that it had containers on it, but it was riding way above the waterline. Then I counted the containers. There were only 15 containers on a ship designed to hold 400. And I have an app on my phone. I looked up the ship. It was coming from Bremerton, Washington. And ordinarily, those ships would be just packed with containers. And it's just one snapshot. It's just one anecdote. But to me, it's a visual representation of the dramatic slowdown in the economy. So Chris Matthews is done at MSNBC. 74 years old. He's been there since 1997, and I watched in his early days. I knew Chris Matthews before he became a TV star. In the early 90s, he was the Washington bureau chief for the Hearst-owned San Francisco Examiner. I talked to him once or twice a month. He was a likable guy. He shared his knowledge without running over everybody else or interrupting. He wasn't mean and cranky. He wasn't nearly as full of himself as he is today. And so I don't take pleasure in his decline. Margaret Sullivan writes in the Washington Post today that while comments perceived as sexist uh, by female guests on his show surfaced and led to his forced retirement, it's interesting because her criticism of Chris Matthews is similar to what I just read by Caitlin Johnstone about Joe Biden. Margaret Sullivan concludes that the hardball host had lost his fastball, and that's my line, and that uh, he had cognitive issues. Trevor Noah and uh, also John Oliver have been running clips of uh, Matthews struggling to get his lines right at the end of his show. So there goes Chris Matthews. Meanwhile, the conflict between Syria and Turkey is getting more deadly as Erdogan of Turkey has followed through on his threat to push refugees toward Greece. And a toddler died in the ocean crossing from the Turkish mainland to an island in Greece yesterday. Erdogan is going to Moscow to meet with Putin and to try to negotiate a ceasefire with Syria. That will be on Thursday. Netanyahu surprised me. Crooked Bibi appears to have a new lease on life. He is claiming to have 59 committed Knesset seats, and he needs 61 to form a government. That's about four more seats than he had in the first and second rounds of these protracted election processes. This leads Benny Gantz of the Blue and White Party with uh, very few options. And it's clear that Netanyahu will be invited to form a government. And despite the fact that he is on trial for corruption, he is likely to remain prime minister. And the New York Times offers this. Israeli law isn't clear about whether someone facing corruption charges can legally form a government. The Israeli Supreme Court delayed ruling on the matter in January, saying, well, it's a hypothetical question. But now it appears to be a real question, and we'll see how the court deals with it. And finally today, Apple is in the process of finalizing a settlement that could put $25 in my pocket. It relates to claims that they design phones with planned obsolescence. And that the longer you own your phone, the slower it operates. Now, I haven't seen this with my iPhone 
but I have an original iPad that I had to stop using because it doesn't, it, it won't run the latest iOS systems, and therefore all the software, the apps that I use on it, are dead. The machine works fine, the battery works fine, but I can't use it anymore because Apple has made sure that it is obsolete. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. You're free to share it all over the place, even with Joe Biden. You'll find it on YouTube. And I'm Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling.